record. Okay, so now I'm on record. This is being recorded. Um, I'm going to talk to both of you informally for a second, but let me just say one thing right at the beginning. This is a very important point. Uh, can you see my mouse? Yes. yes. Okay, here's the problem, and this isn't so much for you, Dee, or Mindy, unless you go back in to look at this recorded session. I'm going to come up here. And I'm going to, uh, let's see, what do I want to do here? I want to uh, annotate. Is that what it is? Yeah, I want to spotlight. I don't know whether the mouse is going to work. I'm going to try the mouse. Okay. I'm going to mm. try the mouse. Here's the problem that I've encountered with this system. Are you guys familiar with this system? Did you have a, a course last mod, either one of you? Yeah. Just the one. <laughs> Just the one. Everything is still what, fairly new. What did you guys have last mod? I know my... Yeah, I had... um. Type, was it typography? No, layout. Yeah, layout and typography, sorry. Okay, D. And, um, is that you, D? Yes. Okay, so you had layout. Mindy, did you have anything last mod? Yeah, I had typography. You did. Okay, the reason I'm asking this is because then you would have worked with this system and you probably have a little bit of an idea of some of the issues that have been going on with this system, correct? Yes. Okay. One of the problems that I've encountered, and I spoke to the people at Zoom about this, and I don't know whether you've noticed this in your recorded sessions or not, but it's not capturing the mouse when I'm in my programs. Now, I just put on this mouse thing here, and I, I don't know whether that's going to record it or not. I'm hoping that's going to record that mouse. But it's very frustrating for me as an instructor to instruct you and then not have it capturing the mouse because the, you need to see what I'm doing with the mouse. That's part of the whole process. And it just makes it a little more difficult to try to demonstrate these things if you're not able to see the mouse and what the mouse is doing. So I've got this mouse set on here, and maybe I'll also highlight. Okay, so now I've got a mouse and I've got a highlight on this. That's going mm -hmm. to show something, and I guess something is better than nothing. What I am told from the people at Zoom is, in about a month, they are going to correct this issue, and then you're going to be able to see my mouse and what it's doing in the programs. So do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. So that's the, that's the first and foremost thing. I just want to get that clear with you and make sure that you understand that. Because if you go to look at this video, and for all of those people who aren't here tonight, and there's probably about maybe 20-some people that are in this class that aren't here, they're going to go look at that recorded session. They're going to hear me explaining this, and, and some of them may or may not know this already. Did either one of you know, notice that it wasn't recording the uh, mouse? I had noticed, but I know that I rem recall the previous instructor indicating that she also had to use a little highlighter in order for it to record for the recordings. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They're supposed to be able to correct that in about a month. So hopefully we'll get past that issue and uh, we'll see. We'll see whether that works out. Mindy, as I was telling Dee, I would like to keep the mic on so that you can interact with me. Try to keep your environment quiet. Try to keep phones, you know, from ringing and, and um, TVs down and people from talking because that will all be recorded. And uh, here's Benita. Benita's here to join us. Hi, Benita. Um, can you say hello to Dee, myself, and Mindy? Hi, Benita. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Can y'all hear me? We can yes. hear you, yes. Can you hear You can hear yourself talking, can't you? Oh, uh, I guess I can, but I don't think. Uh -oh. Do me okay. a favor, Benita. What you're gonna do? I was just explaining this to Dee and Mindy. We need to keep we need to keep the the noise levels down. So if your if your children around, they gotta go. No, you can put the mic on. I'd like you to have the mic on, but if you can maybe have somebody take care of the child, keep her quiet, so that we can so she we don't get her mixed in to the uh to the discussion tonight. Can you do that? Do you think? Maybe Benita prefers not to have the mic on. That's okay if she doesn't. Uh, Dee and Mindy. Hi. Oh, there you go. Benita, if you can just keep the child is quiet. Is my Turn through. I'm in class right now. No, Mommy's not coming right now. Go over there and watch SpongeBob. Who's talking? 
<laughs> excuse, excuse me, can y'all still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can hear the child too. Maybe you okay, should shut I'm, the mic off. Listen, Benita, here's what I'd like you to do. Shut the mic off. Listen, <laughs> I'm going to leave Dee and Mindy's on. Yes. Dee and Mindy's are in a pretty <laughs> quiet area. But here's the deal. Benita, if you want to say something to me, just let me know and I'll put you, let you put your mic on and ask me the question. I, I want this to be somewhat interactive if we could do that, okay? All right, so um, one other thing I want to talk to you about, I don't know whether you guys, assume you all got my emails. Is that correct, Dee Mindy? You got my emails? Yes. Okay, did they make sense? Did you, did you try to uh, do anything with them? Like, for instance, I had some links. Somebody said that the links didn't work in the emails. Did you find that was the case? No. The links worked that I had in the emails? No, I didn't see any any links for the, the live discussion. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay, so Benita says that the links work in the email. So you were able to go to YouTube or wherever those links took you, and you were able to see the stuff that was there. Yes. Okay, so here's the deal. Somebody has told me that they did not. What I just wanted to tell you, I, I went to a lot of trouble to get you a bunch of really good links that I want you to check out. I think this week it'll... I found... I Who is this? The links to the PowerPoint. I don't think uh, I the sent links a PowerPoint. To the PowerPoint. I don't think I sent a PowerPoint. No, the links to the PowerPoints. What PowerPoint? I don't think I, I don't think I linked to any PowerPoint. Uh, the, in, in the classroom, uh, on the classroom in Canvas, in Canvas, oh. there's a part of the work that we're supposed to review. Yeah. Okay, so you weren't, weren't able to get, you weren't able to get something out of your reading tools, your tools. Is that what it was? I, I didn't get the PowerPoint slides that it refers to, which might just be what you're showing us right now, because well, it refers it refers to something with regards to PowerPoint slides. This is and, the PowerPoint I prepared. Uh, if you send me an email later on tomorrow, I will try to get those PowerPoints and forward them over to you. Or better yet, so I think it has to do with the discussion. Huh? I think it has something to do with the discussion. Okay, Some so of the things that we're here's supposed well, to Here's what I want to, first let me tell you this. What mm -hmm. I did was I supplied those, e those emails that I sent you have links that'll help you with your discussion to make sure okay. that you're able to access them if it, for some reason your email isn't working. What I'd like you to do is go into the announcement areas and you'll see that I've put in several announcements for you and the announcements have those links there as well. So if you're, for some reason, not able to access the links in the email that I sent you, just go into the announcements, and those are the same links, and those links will help you with your discussion, okay? So don't worry too much if you're not able to get the, the, the PowerPoints from the, uh, from the site. Those links, I think, will do more for you than those PowerPoints will as far as learning what you need to deal with in the instruction. As a matter of fact, the discussion, there's two discussions this week. The first discussion is an introduce yourself discussion, right? You know that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So go in and, and introduce yourself and I will, you know, take a look at what you put in. The second discussion will be about cooler. And I also sent you an email, I believe, on Cooler with some links. But I also put another announcement with those links for Cooler. So you can get that, those links, you can take a look at those. And I believe those are YouTube videos, which you'll find very helpful. And I would look at them before you go in. They're only like three-minute, five-minute videos. They're not real long videos. It's not like our two-hour co course tonight. This is just something that you can spend 15 minutes looking at all this and get a really good idea of how to manipulate Cooler. 
So that's what I'd like you to do, and I'd like to announce that to everybody, that you go and check it out. If you're having trouble with anything that I put in there to email, uh, in the, there are some long articles in there, yes. Um, uh, so you don't have to read the whole thing. I, what I'm saying is that you, you read what you think you – okay, if you read it, that's good. Uh, but there's a number of things in there. There's 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 uh, an email that that has information regarding the color processes that we're going to be discussing. And then there's another announcement that's in there that uh, is more directly dealing with cooler. Those are the two issues. This week's about color, but it's also about cooler because cooler is essentially one way uh, to deal with color. So and. Uh, that's that's what I wanted to point out to all of you so that you know basically what all that is. It is important. It, it, it's important because I think it will make your job easier in general. Okay? You have a discussion. I'm trying to make it easy for you to deal with that discussion. The assignment, I'm going to demonstrate how you might approach that assignment tonight. That's essentially what I'm going to do here tonight. And then you have a, um, a little exam. And before I get done tonight, I will more or less walk you through that exam and give you an idea of what that exam will cover so that you won't even have to go into that exam course. you will be able to have some little information about that. Okay, so is there any questions or any comments you got at this point? No, I just wanted to make mention that I found the as you were speaking, I, I went on the other screen and I found the, uh, the four PowerPoints that I was referring to, but it's part of the week one reading and tools. Yep. So if you're, pro since you're providing us with a lot of other resources, I'm sure we won't really need to worry ourselves about that one. Probably but just not. so that you knew I what really they were. I think that, I think that if you were to really take a look at the information that I've given you in those links, I believe that it will more than cover the uh, PowerPoints that are there. I believe the PowerPoints are more or less the same. And I think that the links that I supplied you with will give you a much more complete picture. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you would probably be very safe if, safe if you did that. Okay. All right. Thank Any you. Any other questions? No. Okay. All right. And, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through these PowerPoints first. Here's how what I'm, what I'm going to do. Walk through the PowerPoints first. Talk a little bit about the PowerPoints. I am then going to show you a few things in Adobe Illustrator. We will be working with Adobe Illustrator this, uh, this mod pretty much. Um, I don't remember. I, we may actually work with InDesign, although I don't think we do. I think we actually do all this in Illustrator. Pretty sure we do. Anyway, uh, so I am going to be demonstrating a little bit about Illustrator. By the way, since I am on that topic right now, how do you guys feel about Adobe Illustrator? Are you all comfortable with it? I love it. Who's that, D? D, yes. You love it, huh? Yes. How about you, Mindy? What do you feel about Illustrator? Are you okay with it? Yeah, I'm okay with it. I like Photoshop, though. You like Photoshop better? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I tell you what, it's, it, this is more or less directed towards Illustrator, and the kind of work that we're doing here is perfect for Illustrator. And I just want to point out to you that uh, learn to love Illustrator because it's an incredibly powerful program that I guarantee you, in the end, if you do take the time and effort to learn it and become very good with it, you will never, ever live to regret it. <laughs> okay? Benita, okay. how do you feel about... Uh, how do you feel about Adobe Illustrator? Do you like it? Who? I'm asking Benita. Oh, Benita. Sorry. I got a yep from her, so okay, great. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to be basically looking at some information about color and print. This, this uh, PowerPoint, I don't believe, is the exact PowerPoint that's on the site, but it's a variation of a theme, and it's more or less the kind of things that we're going to be working with, so that's why I got it up here. Then we're going to look at Illustrator. I'm going to show you a little bit about how I approached creating the color wheel. One of the things you're going to do is you're going to create a color wheel. Then what you're going to do is you're going to use your creative skills to put together a way of presenting different color divisions. Okay. Um, 
like for instance, primary colors, uh, tertiary colors, uh, complementary colors, you're going to come up with some creative way of demonstrating them. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that I did, and then I'm not telling you you have to do what I did, but I'm going to give you some ideas as to how I handled it, and then you are going to use your creativity and your imagination to come up with creative ways of doing it, okay? And uh, if you are smart, what you'll do is you will read the instructions that are given you in the, um, in the course for the submissions and try to follow those instructions. It's kind of important that you do that. I've also included a link that shows you what the rubrics will be for this particular course. So you might want to at some point go into the announcement and download those rubrics and take a look at what your expectations will be as far as you know creating the work that you're going to be creating for the mod, okay, if you haven't already done that. Uh, so let's see if I covered it all. I kind of think I've covered it all. Uh, go check out my announcements. I guess that's the most important thing. Go check out my announcements. I did try to send you a, a, a emails that are the same email as the announcements. Uh, and I think I covered it all, but check the announcements anyway. Make sure that I didn't miss anything. Okay. All right. So next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to start our slideshow. Okay, so what I'm going to do is walk you through color theory. Now it says color theory print production, that's the actual course, but we are going to be dealing with this week primarily color theory. Okay? All right. The foundation of color. At its core, color is light. A ray of light is the source of all color. Without light, color does not exist. That's logical. Light is broken down in colors of the spectrum. There are millions of colors, and I mean that. There are millions of colors. What we are going to be learning about this mod is color, and all the different kind of colors that we're going to encounter as graphic designers. We'll get into some of that later on. Every color can be described as having three main attributes. This is one of the very important points, is understanding the three main attributes. The three main attributes are hue, saturation, and brightness. And I'm going to show you how that works in Adobe Illustrator later on tonight. Okay? The color wheel. Okay. This right here is what you are going to be designing, one of the projects. Now, can it be a round one like this? Yeah, color wheel's usually a round. Does it have to be? No. You can use your creativity if you want, but remember this. Whatever you do from a creative standpoint must, in the end, work as a color wheel. Okay? So don't go so crazy with this that it doesn't work as a color wheel. Do you understand what I'm going at here? Try to keep it. Try to keep it in the in the realm of you're showing color and the way that the color is basically represented is in this color wheel. So you're going to be creating some kind of a color wheel. If you make a straightforward color wheel, just sort of like what you see here, that would be fine. I'm not going to turn around and say you weren't very creative. You are being literal, and I don't have a problem with you being literal. Part of this process is to test your skills and your ability and your comfort level with the program Adobe Illustrator. Okay? Did anyone have a question? Nope. Okay. Definition. Infinite combinations of light bent into a circle for ease and convenience. Sir Isaac Newton was the first to, blend, to bend colors into a circle. Uh, a little note here. This Sir Isaac Newton issue will come up in your assessment questioning. They're going to want to know who was the first to create the colors, and the answer will probably be, if I'm not mistaken, Sir Isaac Newton. So you might want to make a little mental note of that, okay? The color wheel divisions. The color wheel can be divided in half to create warm colors and cool colors. So obviously, if you see here, we've got our warm colors over here, and we've got our cool colors over here. Typically, warm colors imply energy and are very vivid. 
they advance in space. What that means essentially is for some strange optical reason, warm colors tend to bring objects out at you. They, they tend to make things appear like they're coming in your direction. Cool colors usually give the impression of more calm and relaxed atmosphere, and they tend to be a little bit deeper visually. And it's a, it's a mental thing. But it is something that has been proven. People sort of see warmer colors as closer to them, and w cool colors tend to recede. Okay? Uh -huh. Hues of the color wheel. There are 12 hues in a color wheel. So what you're going to be doing when you create your color wheel is you're going to be de demonstrating these hues. And a hue is another name for color. Okay. So that's really what you're looking at right here. We're looking at red, red, orange, orange, yellow, orange, yellow, yellow, green, green, blue, green, blue, blue, violet, violet, red, violet, and red. What I do, and I will get into this a lot after when I get into illustrated with you, is I went online and I looked up color wheel. I went did a Google search on color wheel and I looked for images of color wheel. And I came up with thousands. And all I did was I grabbed one or two that I thought represented it the way I wanted it to be represented and saved it to my desktop, brought it into Illustrator, stole the colors right from it, and then built my own variation and used those colors. And I'm going to show you how I did that when I get into Illustrator in a little while so that you can get a really good idea of how you might accomplish the same thing. My ultimate goal here is to try to make all this stuff that you have to achieve in the next four weeks as easy as possible. I mean, I, I, I try to make things clear for you, make you understand what it is that we're trying to learn here. But my other goal is to try to make it easy on you and so that you guys can really accomplish this. Think of me as your art director. I'm the one that's going to tell you how to go about doing this in a way that you can succeed with. Okay? Because that's essentially what an art director does. A good art director will take his, his assistant art directors and his designers and they, he will put uh, he will put things on them to do that they can do within the limits of their abilities. And he does it in such a way that they can succeed because the ultimate goal is to get the job done and get it done properly so that they can get paid and go home. That's really how the whole thing works. And it's sort of the same thing here. Look at me as an art director. I want to make sure that you get the job done right. So I'm going to do everything I can possibly do to make it possible for you to get the job done right. All right. Awesome. Primary hues, blue, yellow, and red. Take a look at my color wheel. Notice that I've made it different, haven't I? I've actually gone in there and I've subdued many of the colors. And what I've done is I've left the three colors that we're talking about, the primaries, the red, the yellow, and the blue, I've left them full value. Okay? So what I've done is I've taken the these colors here and I've essentially desaturated them that's that's essentially what I did to make I didn't make them go away I just desaturated them making them appear lighter to emphasize my primary colors. so primary hues or colors are what we are dealing with on this particular variation of our color wheel I'm also going to show you how I achieved this when I get into showing you a little later on Illustrator and what Illustrator can do for you. All right. They are called primary because they cannot be combined by mixing any other colors. So those three colors right there, you cannot get by mixing other colors. Now, secondary hues, this is the same deal. I've gone in here and I've sort of desaturated a number of these colors and I've left three, I've chosen three of the secondary hues. There are many other secondary hues in here. I simply chose orange, green, and violet. They're made by combining equal amounts of the primary colors together. So that's really how this works. And if you see how this thing works here, you can kind of get the idea. Orange, or I'm sorry, red, red, orange, orange, and then yellow, orange. You see how they're mixing together? They mix 
the, the ones that are right next to one another get mixed and you get your colors. And here we have tertiary or intermediate hues. Same deal. I, I came in here and I used my basic color wheel. I desaturated the colors that I didn't want to have in the mix and I left the colors that I'm using full strength. So it's yellow, green, blue, green, blue, violet, red, violet, red, orange, yellow, orange, made by combining a primary and a secondary hue in equal amounts. So there's another way that you can go about making colors in your color wheel. Again, you're not going to do any of this because this is not how you're using this color wheel. You're building a color wheel and you're building it correctly to demonstrate your ability to, to think and do this. That's really what this is all about. And once you have that color wheel, you're just going to demonstrate a couple of these principles in a similar fashion to the way I'm demonstrating them right here. And again, I'm going to show you how I did this so that if you want to try to go in that direction, you'll know how to do it. Always named by the primary color first. So that's another thing that you should know about. When you are creating a tertiary color, uh, it's always named by the primary color first. So some of the basic color schemes and color harmonies, monochromatic, you're going to see dem a demonstration of these in a minute. Monochromatic, analogous, complementary, triadic, split complementary, tetradic or rectangle, and square. The first one is monochromatic. One color or hue plus all of its tints, that's the key, tints, shades, and tones. And here you see a range of colors based on a monochromatic color scheme where you have all of its tints and its shades and its, and its tones. And that's what it looks like. Notice that they all have six-digit hexadecimal numbers. Each one of them six hexadecimal number associated with it. Every color has a six-digit hexadecimal number value associated with it. And you'll see that when you get into Illustrator as well. At any point, got a question or a thought, feel free to shout it out to me. Oh, did I go past one? I did. Yeah, here we go. Okay, analogous color scheme. Colors that are side by side on the color wheel. So what is analogous? There is an analogous color scheme where you have a green primary color and then you have two colors that are complementary to it sitting side by side. Colors that are side by side, they are often found in nature. They're harmonious, serene, they're comfortable. Getting enough contrast between the colors is key. The first thing I want you to notice about this is, you notice how from a, from a uh, contrast standpoint, you notice how they tend to be almost the same color in terms of visual contrast. Can you see that? This one is probably the one that has the greatest amount of contrast to it. These two are very similar in contrast and almost tend to blend together into one. So you gotta be very careful when you're using these to somehow or other work with some contrast. Choose one color to dominate, the second as support, and the third as an accent. So you might be able to do that by, let's say for instance I decided that I wanted to go with green-blue as my dominant color. I could use my, sec my secondary color and my tertiary could be the green and the uh, yellow-green. And what I could do is I could see how I basically uh, lightened, lightened these colors here. I could lighten this color and I could come in and I could and I could darken this color. I could uh, increase the uh, or lower the brightness of this color and uh, I could desaturate this color. That would be one way to do it. And I could do all this right in Adobe Illustrator in the color, color palette and I will try to show you that and how that works a little later on tonight. Any questions? Mm -mm. Good. Colors that are directly across, this is complementary colors. Colors that are directly across from each other. So anytime you have a color that is directly across, you have a complementary color scheme. Basic examples, red-green, blue-orange, violet-yellow. 
due to the high contrast nature, the color scheme tends to be very vibrant and energetic, especially if used at full saturation. So again, you gotta be kind of careful how you use something like this. There are mechanisms that you can use. You can use saturation and brightness to modify one of the colors, leaving one more or less the dominant color and the other a, a, a secondary color by either modifying its brightness or its, its uh, saturation. Those are just a couple of suggestions of how you do this. Triadic color scheme, three colors evenly spaced in a triangle around the color wheel. So look at this. I have orange over here. I have violet over here, and I have green down here. So they are evenly spaced. So anytime I have colors that are evenly spaced, okay, like this, you have a triadic color scheme. It has a vibrant look, even if not used fully saturated. To use successfully, choose one color to dominate and equally balance the other two. That's a little bit different than the other selection, which is to... Uh, have one dominate and one be secondary and one be uh, complementary or um, uh, what's the word that I want to use here uh, supportive it's not the right word but anyway but you're gonna find that most of these color schemes are going to be asking you to consider using one in a dominant manner you're going to take one color and use it in a dominant matter so in other words you're going in the direction of say violet that's the color that's going to be the dominant color you would use the orange and the green in some way to support the violet. Now, maybe they might be desaturated. You might desaturate them some. And, and again, just so that you know, these colors over here, they're desaturated. That's what I'm talking about. So if you were going to go with violet, you might take the orange and desaturate it, make it softer in appearance. The green, maybe what you could do is you could darken that, make it appear dark. And that would be something that would be supportive of violet as well. So these are the kind of thoughts that you would do if you start working with colors in this kind of a color scheme. All right? Split complementary color schemes. Essentially what that means is you've got your complementary colors. One of the colors you're choosing the complement of. The other color, instead of choosing the complement, you're splitting. You're going to the colors that are on either side of the complement. So this complement's being used. This one is not. You're picking the colors on either side of the complement. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. That's called a split complementary color scheme. It's visually strong, but not as tense as the high contrast complementary color scheme. Easy to use with good results. Tetradic or rectangular. Color yes. Scheme. What you're doing here, four colors arranged in two complementary pairs. Allows for a rich color. Works best if one color dominates. Mostly, they do this. Pay attention to the balance between warm and cool colors. Square color scheme, basically what you're doing is you're placing your colors at equal positioning around the color wheel. Four colors spaced evenly around the color wheel. Very similar to tetradic color scheme. Works best if one color is dominant. Most of them do. Pay attention to the balance between warm and cool colors. So you got to be careful which ones you pick. Uh, tints, shades, and tones. Tints made by adding white to a pure color. So here's your tint. What you're doing essentially is, in effect, you're washing the color out. As you, this would be your most saturated color right here. And then what you're doing is you're adding amounts of white to it, white to it, white to it, white to it, until you literally reach a point where the tint itself, the color, I'm sorry, the color isn't present anymore. And then of course shaded, you're adding black to the color. So this is what happens if you go in and you use uh, a shade. What you're doing essentially is starting with your full value color here, start adding small amounts of black to it, and you get a range of colors until at some point you've added enough black that it totally overwhelms the color and the color is essentially gone and a tone made by adding gray to pure color. So you never actually reach black. You're just basically looking to add more and more of a gray to it until it ultimately does, in fact, go gray. Okay? Neutrals. White, 
doesn't absorb color waves. White reflects all color waves. The color of light is white. Black absorbs all color waves. It reflects no light. So if you have something that's an absolute black and you bounce light at it, it doesn't really reflect it back off. It absorbs it, and you really see that blackness of it. Grays are known as impure whites. Grays reflect an equal part of each color wave. The more light gray reflects, the lighter it looks. The more light absorbed, the darker it looks. So it all depends on the level of gray. If you have a very light gray as opposed to a dark, darker gray. Okay, any questions? No. Okay. Pantone color matching system. We will be dealing with that next week. One of the standardized color reproduction systems. You will learn uh, a bit about this in this course, and it is something very important for you to know because you will be creating process color work, but you will also be working with spot color. And spot color requires the use of the Pantone color matching system. It's very easy to work with. Uh, I will show you where to find it and how to access it, how to select colors and apply colors in Adobe Illustrator. And uh, you should be a whiz, uh, whiz at it very easily. So there's roughly 1,100 spot colors created by 13 base pigments, including black and white. CMYK colors are grouped in a subset of PMS. So in fact, there are CMYK, which stands for, I, I assume you guys know this, right? Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. You guys are aware of that, what that, what that is? Heard the terms before? Yeah. No? Has anybody? Yeah. When you work in four-color process printing, you're working with cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Those are the four colors that are mixed together using plates to develop a full color image in printing. So, and CMYK. So what happens is that there are specific colors that are CMYK colors that are also mixable in PMS. You can produce metallic and fluorescence as well. Metallics and fluorescence cannot be produced in CMYK at all. So if you're going to produce something that includes a metallic color, you would have to produce that using a separate plate or a separate, separate printing plate to, uh, to um, create that metallic or fluorescent color. It's a special color, and it's outside the scope of CMYK. It allows designers to effectively communicate color and, have not, and not have to be in the same place to do so. Colors described by numbers. So here's a couple of PMS colors. PMS 200 is a color. PMS 1795C, which stands for coded, is another color. And again, I'm just reading these things to you. It probably don't mean very much to you, but once you actually see the CMYK color library and see the colors that are in there and put a couple of them into your <laughs> Uh, color palette in Adobe Illustrator, it'll begin to make a lot more sense to you. Okay. Other Pantone systems. There's the Pantone Go system, GOE system. Pantone's newer matching and numbering system to keep up with technologies. There's 2,000 plus colors in it. Uses fewer base colors, only 10. And it includes RGB, screen-based colors. More features including interactive software and online community. And then there's Pantone Hexachromes, a six color ultra high quality printing. There's Pantone Fashion and Home, Pantone Plastics. Each one of these different color systems work for some other particular group or industry area. For instance, plastic materials, Pantone Plastics. The Fashion and Home uh, industry, the Pantone Fashion and Home Colors. So again, hexachromes, hexachromes are uh, the six-digit numbers, which include um, web-based. Web Basic rules of color usage. Now, this is kind of generic stuff I just want you to know about and understand. Let me move this up a bit. 
the right color equals the right message. It's very important. Color is a very important thing. People who are producing marketing materials, advertising materials, spend tons and tons of money having designers work out sophisticated color schemes for their companies. So this is a very serious business, and I just want you to understand that. So understand the source of color meanings. All color meanings are rela relatively influenced by a variety of factors. Males and females respond to color differently. Age, race, gender, mood, history, tradition, all of these factor into how people understand or, or people are influenced by color. Anticipate the audience perception. A designer's job is to leverage color meaning to achieve the client's goal. So what you really want to be able to do, if you can possibly do this, in your study is to understand a little bit about how males and females respond differently to color. How race, age, gender, mood, history, tradition, how all that factors in. You'd have to be an expert on it, but you should have some understanding of it so that you can anticipate an audience perception. Who is your audience going to be? And what might they think about color? So that you might come up with some kind of a clue from this that will help you to pick the proper colors. Create color harmony. Make good color choices. Color science becomes art when a designer knows how to use color properly. Part of the reason that you're here is to give you some basis of understanding how to use color properly. That's what I'm hoping you'll get from this. Remember, contrast is key. When you have colors, you don't want colors to appear to fall into one another. You want them to be able to stand apart. You want them to be separate. You want them to be unique, even if they're used in a group. Experiment after learning how to apply to basics. You can always tell when a designer has learned color because a, a designer knows how to go in and experiment and play with color and break rules. If you know how to work with color, you can figure out ways to break rules that will work. Attract and hold attention. Color is a visual language. It's actually part of the total visual language. Being a graphic designer, one of your tools, one of your primary tools is color. Color psych, uh, psychology. The eye naturally sees certain colors in contrast, specifically colors found in rainbow spectrum. Dominant wavelengths, what the eye see can easily perceive. Then there are things like optical illusions created by colors and after imaging. Color is always seen in context. Color is relative. There's color proximity. Human perception mixes colors that are next to each other and forms a color impression based on the entire composition. That's it. There is my PowerPoint. Are there any questions about any of that? No. Would you like it if I took that PowerPoint and put it up into announcements that, so that you could download it? Would that be helpful, do you think? Yes. I would. I would really appreciate it. Okay. I will see you <laughs> then uh, tomorrow. By tomorrow, I have it up in announcements. You can go in and you can download it and uh, use it as you feel fit. So, no questions about any of that? Nope. All right. So, uh, I have this here. I want to just quickly talk none, about none. color models mm. very quickly. This is something that's kind of short. Color model is an abstract mathematical model describing the way color can be represented as numbers. Typically, of three or four values or color components. When this model is associated with a precise description of how the components are to be interpreted, viewing conditions, etc., the resulting set of colors is called a color space. So what you need to know about this is that there are several different primary color spaces. The first color space is the RGB color space. And what happens with the RGB? We're looking at RGB color tonight on our monitors. RGB colors are primarily used by monitors. Medias that transmit light, such as television, and, or in our case, our laptops or our monitors of our computers, 
use additive colors, mixing the primary colors of red, green, and blue, each of which stimulates one of three types of eye color receptors with a little stimulation as possible of the other two. This is called RGB color space. Mixtures of light of these primary colors cover a large part of the human color space and thus produce a large part of human color experience. This is why color television sets and color computer mo monitors need only produce mixtures of red, green, and blue light. Other primary colors could, be uh, could in principle be used, but with red, green, and blue, the largest portion of the human color space can be captured. Unfortunately, there is no exact consensus as to what logic in the uh, chromatically diagram the red, green, and blue colors should have. So the same RGB values can raise to slightly different colors in different screens. So essentially what that means is that different screens might present color to you a little bit different. And if you were to have in front of you a Macintosh computer and a PC, you could literally visually see that. They do work differently. They're manufactured differently. They basically are operating the same way but just by virtue of them coming from different sources, they're not going to be manufactured in the same place. So there'd be slight differences to it. So the thing that you want to remember here right off the bat is RGB color is what is known as a additive color. And CMYK, which is the next one we're going to talk about, CMYK color is subtractive. And essentially how that works is it's used primarily in the printing industry and what you do essentially is you take the images apart in their components if you have a full color picture you take that picture apart into the components of cyan magenta yellow and black it breaks an image apart into those four component colors puts them on their own separate unique plate the plate is then put on the, or the four plates are then put on to a printer and the colors are then printed one at a time back onto paper or whatever the substrate is. And it's usually a white substrate. And paper is a good one to, to use. And once you put them all back together, you then get what appears to be a full color image. So that's essentially what CMYK is. It's possible to achieve a large range of colors seen by humans by combining cyan, magenta, yellow, transparent, dyes, inks on a white substrate. These are subtractive primary colors, often a fourth ink, often is not actually correct. Usually a fourth ink black is added to improve reproduction of some dark colors. See, theoretically, you should only have to use CMY, which is cyan, magenta, and yellow. And by adding equal parts of CMY together, you should end up with black. But if you do that, you don't actually end up with black. You end up with a kind of a muddyish, brownish, purple color, which is very unappealing. So what they have come up with to combat that is they've incorporated a black plate, uh, a, a hit of black color over top of the dark areas so that it fills in and makes real true black that we expect to see. So does that make sense to you? Do you kind of get the idea? What do you guys think? Any questions? Yes. <clears throat> You'll hear more about this. Um, the cyan uh, ink absorbs red light, but it transmits green and blue. The magenta ink absorbs green light, but transmits red and blue. And the yellow ink absorbs blue light, but transmits red and green. The white substrates reflect the transmitted light back to the viewer. Because in practice, CMYK ink is suitable for printing, also reflect a little bit of color, make a deep and neutral black impossible. The K black ink component, usually printed last, is needed to compensate for the deficiencies. That's essentially what I was saying. You mix the three together, they don't really give you a true black. They give you something less than black, kind of a muddy, you know, purpley brown thing. And then they're putting black over top of that to fill in, and it ends up giving you black. Then there's grayscale. I'm not going to get into all these others. There's really, I'm just, well, there's just grayscale here. Grayscale mode uses different shades of gray in an image, an 8-bit image. There can be up to 256 shades of gray. 
Every pixel of a grayscale image has a brightness value ranging from zero, which is black. So if you have zero, you know that you're look, talking about black. 255 means white. So if somebody says to you, what does the color 255 mean? It means white. And zero means black. And in, in between there, any, any number between 255 and zero is some form or another of a gray. In 16 and 32-bit uh, images, the number of shades in an image is much greater. Grayscale values can also be men measured as percentage of black ink coverage. Zero percent meaning equaling white, 100 percent black. So if you go 50 percent black, you've got halfway between white and black. You're right in the middle. And as you go closer to black, 60%, 70%, your gray gets darker and darker and darker. As you reach towards 0, 30, 20, 10, it becomes lighter and lighter. Any questions about any of that? Again, this is just an informal reading on this, and uh, you'll, you'll get, we'll talk more about this as we go along. Okay. All right. That brings me to... Illustrator. And let me first start off by going to my color wheel. So here's my color wheel. What I did as I explain this to you, I want to show you something. Here is a normal swatches palette. You guys, when you open up a file in Adobe Illustrator, usually your swatches panel looks like this. It's all filled with all these colors. These colors are not your colors at all. These are just colors that some designer decided they were going to put in there to help you. And, I don't know, maybe they help. But generally, as a graphic designer, what I do and what I think you should do and what I'm going to show you to do and what I'm going to hope you're going to learn to do is to get rid of all these colors and to produce and save your own colors that you're going to use in your productions. So I'm going to start off this by saying how I did this, and I'll demonstrate how I made this in a minute. I went in and I found a color wheel that was similar to this, that had all my colors the way I wanted them, and I saved it and I placed it into my file. Then what I did is I literally came in here and I picked my eyedropper tool, and I came in and I sampled each one of the color and I put it in here. So what I'm going to do is a variation of that right now to create my swatch panel. I wanted you to see how I do this. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is, you see there's a little menu here. If I click on this, have you ever been into this menu before? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah? I have. Okay. All right. So now that I'm in here. More specifically. Okay. I'm not hearing you very well, so anyway, here's what I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is, I got all these colors in here, I don't really want them. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to click Select All Unused. Now I want you to see this. Look, you see all those colors came up. You see them? They all came up. The reason they all came up is because I'm not using any of those colors. None of these colors are in there. And I want, I want my swatches to be those colors, not all this. So again, I come in here with them deselected, and I just go like this, click, and I go select all unused colors. And you might do this the moment you open up and create your Adobe Illustrator file to get rid of these colors so you can start creating your own colors. I didn't do this because I wanted to be able to demonstrate how to do this. And I wanted to do it with a file so that I could very quickly start loading my colors in there. So now that I've got all these selected, I'm going to just hit the garbage can. Delete the swatches. Yep, that's what I want to do. Bye. They're all gone. <laughs> and what's left is I'm going to click on this and remove that because it didn't go away. Now it did. What I'm left with is none, registration, white, and black. Most of the time, those four colors will remain. They will not go away. They stick, they stay. 
which is cool because black and white you always want to have in there. You'll always have use for black and white. If you don't use them, they're not going to hurt you to have them in there. The none color is, is not going to go away and there's no problem with that. And this registration color is going to stay as well. So now that I've done this, what I want to do is I want to start putting all these colors into my palette. And I do that by coming over here since I already have them loaded and I'm going to start by clicking on the colors and I have this grouped. This whole thing is grouped. So I have a choice. I can either go up to the object menu and I can go ungroup or if I want I can come over here and I can choose the direct selection, I'm sorry, the group selection tool. And if I click on the group selection tool I now click on that red. Notice that what it does is it throws the red and the little bit of gray that I used on the outlines of this, see it? Mm -hmm. In my fill and my stroke. So this, this little piece here has a fill of red and a stroke of gray. Now each one of these has a stroke of gray. So I'm going to want that gray color as well. But I'm going to start off by grabbing that red, holding it, I'm holding my mouse, and I'm going to drag it right into my swatches panel. And now I got my red in there. Then I'm going to come here and I'm going to bring my stroke forward. And I'm going to click on it, drag, and drop that gray. And now I have my gray and I have my red. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring my fill forward again. Because I don't want to get the gray anymore. I got it once. Once is enough. They're all the same gray. But what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to load all these other colors. There's the orange, the red orange, I should say. And then I'm going to click on the orange, and I'm going to drag the orange in. This is really simple. Click on this, and I'm going to drag the, that yellow orange in, and then the yellow, and I'm just going to work my way around, and I'm going to load in all of my colors that I'm using for my project. Okay, keep going. I got a few more to go and then we'll be done. Boom, drag that in there. And next one, and one more. And that's that right there, the red violet. There it I'm is. I'm sorry, I have a quick question. Go right ahead. Which one of this color reveal, which one would be considered indigo? Indigo? Indigo, the closest that would be, see there's, it would be somewhere between these two colors right there. Indigo would be kind of like a, a, a slightly purplish deep, deep blue, I believe, would be an indigo. And I don't really think indigo is in here. I think the closest is the blue, violet, violet, somewhere around there would be in an indigo area. It would be a little bit darker than what we have. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any questions about what I did? Any thoughts as to why I'm doing this? Does anybody want to, you know, ask me why I'm doing this? I'm doing this because basically I'm creating a color library based on my project. And I, I, a good designer working in a program such as this will do these kind of things because you never know when you actually will need to work on something and have those colors. So as you create it, what you want to do is you want to remove all of those colors that are in there because those colors do not relate to the work that you're doing. They're just colors that are there when you open up a document. And it's always a good idea to get rid of those. Yeah, what's the question? From Benita? Watch this. Benita, do you want to you want to put your mic on and ask me because I'm not sure I'm understanding the question that you're asking me. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Go ahead and ask the question because I don't quite get it. Okay. The swatches that you deleted before you started this process, are they gone for good? Only they good? in this document. Just for this document. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm I'll show you something. Let me show you something. Watch. Watch this. This will only take a minute. File new. Okay. I, I'm not, I'm not going to play around with this. I'm just opening up a document to show you something. Right. Watch panel. Hit okay. There you go. Look, see? Okay, cool. You document those colors. My whole point is that when you open up any document, when you create a new document, these are the colors that are always there. 
Okay. That's the colors that you get. Not saying there's anything wrong with those colors, but they're not your colors. They're just colors that somebody put in there. And you so, probably aren't really going to use those colors. So, so, so basically what you're telling us when we're working in, when we design designing something, whatever our color schemes are, if we just yeah. go ahead and... That's, yeah, that's why smart. you have a swatches panel so that you can mm. physically build anything that you're going to be using in that particular piece and store them there for easy usage. So what you want to do right away is just go here and right. come down to select all unused and then hit the garbage can and delete all of it. Okay, so my next question would be, say if we made colors that we want to keep for, uh, is there a way like to save our own library of colors that we make? No, but what you can do is you can come in and you can load a library. There's a way that you could go in and load a library from uh, another file. Okay. Or what you could do is you could uh, select the objects and uh, bring them into another into another uh, project and copy them. Okay. All right. So this is I'm going to close because this was just a quick demonstration. Now, if you want to make a color, what you do here is you click, and this is your color picker. And I just want to take one second and show you this because this is something very interesting. So we have hue. Remember we talked about hue, saturation, and brightness. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This slider here, this is what's known as your hue. That's your hue slider. So notice as I move up and down, I'm changing the hue. Hue means color. So I, if you look in the upper corner here, as I move this around, that color is changing to match the position on my hue slider. Okay? And then we have saturation. Here's the saturation. That right there is a fully saturated red. You see the top half of that little square? Mm -hmm. That's a fully saturated red. As I move across in a straight line, can you see how the color is desaturating? That's the equivalent of adding the white into the color that we discussed in the PowerPoint slide. You see it? And if I keep going all the way over to the other side, I've added so much white, in fact, that it has become white. It's really simple. And I'm going to come back a little bit so that you can see the color come back. There's the color coming back. Now, if I want, I want to add uh, brightness to this. I can start coming down. And notice what I'm doing is I'm adding a little bit of black to this as I go down more and more and more and more and more black until if I get to a certain point, I'm essentially looking at black. So you have hue, saturation, and lightness or brightness right there. Got it? Yeah. And in here, these are, you have hue, saturation, and brightness. You have RGB. Check this out. Remember what it said about black? It's zero, zero, zero. And if you go to white, watch this. Uh, I didn't quite get it. Let me go to right up in the corner. 255, 255, 255. Remember they just said that? White mm -hmm. is 255. Black is zero. Remember? Yes. Okay. So there you go. And look at in here. CMYK is the same thing. Look at this. Zero, zero, zero. If I come over here, watch the CMYK. You see it's a certain percentage of cyan. 49% cyan, magenta, 84% magenta, yellow, 73% yellow, and K, 74% black. Give me that color right there. So that's what you have here. And this is your hexadecimal number. So this little palette here gives you, and we're going to talk more about this later on. Right now, I'm just giving you a very quick look at this. Okay? Any other questions about this? Um, I have a question. Sure, um, right ahead. Like, if you want a certain color, like, say, periwinkle or something, how would you know where to find that color? Or do you just kind of have to guess? Uh, they don't actually have named colors like that. Right. So I, I would <laughs> – it would be difficult. You would have to probably 
know the color and be able to locate the color in one of the color libraries that's close to Periwinkle. Or I, here's a crazy suggestion, but it might work. Maybe go in and Google the color Periwinkle and yeah. see what color comes up and maybe grab a graphic of it, copy it to your desktop, bring it in, and then use the eyedropper tool to sample it. Now, mm -hmm. does that mean it's true periwinkle? No, it's some visual representation of periwinkle that you get. I don't know that you would actually be able to find periwinkle as a particular color and hit it 100% on the head. It would be something that you would have to kind of whip up. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Sure, go right ahead. Who is this? It's Benita. Go ahead. Um, it, um, in our study, should we, um, like, say, say if we create a color and we really like it, and those numbers that's off to the right, should we, like, record them? Is it, like, a good practice to, be, like, to know the numbers, or is that not necessary? No, I would do that. If you create a color that you really like, you, you, could, you could create a color and you could save it. I believe if you become a member of Cooler, what you can do is you can store cooler colors that you create up in the cooler, in your cooler. You'd have okay. to join cooler. It doesn't cost anything to join it. When you go and check cooler out, you can see how that can be done. Okay. Any others? All right, let's get down to some fun. Let's cancel this, and let's let's get this out of here. Okay, hit this, save it. To, uh, no. Okay. So this is my this is my color wheel, and as I explained to you how I did this, I went online and I grabbed a color wheel so I could get my colors, and I made my colors, and then I created a color wheel. So this is essentially how I did this. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to color wheel example number two. This is the, this is the, the list of the colors that I use. There are the colors. These are the 12 hues. The red is ED1 E4. Each one of these things has a hexadecimal value. And if you were to use that hexadecimal value, you would see that it would create that red. That red orange is F26621. There's your red orange. If I put that number into my color panel, you'll get that orange. As a matter of fact, I'll show you. Watch this. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to choose in here, which is my hexadecimal, that color right there, F26621. Watch this. F26621. And I'm going to click here and... Come on, why isn't it giving to me? Did I do it right? F26621. Yeah, I didn't get that color. Isn't that odd? Let's try Maybe if you hit enter after the number at the end. Oh, there you go. That's what it is. Enter, but I didn't want to enter it. I just wanted to. There it is. But anyway, that is what it is. I thought if I could click up here, I maybe had to click over there. Anyway, there's the color. You can see that's the color. So there are the colors. How did I get those colors? As I explained to you, what I did was I went online and I, uh, I found a color wheel. Uh, and again, this is just, for me, it was a time-saving device. And I offer it to you as a possible way of doing it because it's a time-saving device. Save you a little bit of trouble trying to figure out what these colors are. Use somebody else's colors, okay? If you would like, what I could do is I could put this document up into announcements and you could use those colors up there. I, I, I'm telling you, you can probably do just as well by going in and creating your own library. Oh, and by the way, just to let you know, look again, what's going on here? Anybody can tell me? What do you see? What do you see there? Colors. The original swatches came back. So what? No, they didn't come back. I'm in another document. What okay. didn't I do? You didn't clear the unused. I didn't clear the unused, and I didn't load my colors. Okay? Right. right. So what I would do first is come up here and select all unused and hit delete. Yes. And now click on this and hit delete. And yes. Now, why am I doing this? I'll tell you why. Because I am going to show you the steps to make 
this. I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do next. How I did this is kind of demonstrated here, but I'm going to show you how I did this. So in case you want to try to do this using the program, you can. Okay? So I think the logical thing to do before I do that is to fix my swatches up so I can load the color very quickly. So let's do that first. I'm going to come over here, and this is again red. I'm going to bring the red in first. Then I'm going to click in the orange. And it's, again, this thing is grouped. So I'm going to come in and get my group selection tool. Click on the orange. There we go. Bring the orange in next. And then this one here, yellow orange. Next. There. Yellow. There. Okay. Yellow green. And green. I know this is a little boring, but it, it will make sense in a minute. You'll see why I bother doing this. Bring it Are in. Are you using um, the direct select tool? I'm using the group select tool. Group select. Yeah, okay. there's actually many of these tools you'll notice have that little device in the corner there. You see them? That little, mm -hmm. that little triangle in the corner? That means that there's more than one tool. And I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but this thing over here is called the tear out. And if you click on that, it actually pulls that little panel out. And now I have my direct selection tool, my group selection tool, and I can quickly grab it and I can come in and I can, you know, make sure I always got my group selection tool. I'm not using the direct selection tool. I'm using the group selection tool. That allows me to select individual objects that are in a group. Okay. All right, so I got that color. This color is the next color. I'm almost done. Got like two more to go. And then I just got to get the gray in there. And that one. And let me just quickly get the gray in. Oops, I didn't get it. There we go. What the heck is that? <laughs> oh, I know what it is. I grabbed it from the wrong place. That's why. There we go. And now I'm going to bring this gray forward and bring the gray in there. So now I have all my colors in there. Now what I want to do is I want to show you how I created my image right here. And I'm going to do it with this object right here. This is nothing more than an oval that I created. Okay? And I did that by coming over here and choosing my ellipse tool. And I held down the shift key. When I hold down the shift key and I start dragging out a shape, I don't get an oval. I'm letting go of the shift key. And you see how I can turn this into a, an oval? By holding the shift key, I can't. I get a circle. So I want a circle. So I hold the shift key down, and I drag out my basic shape. There's my basic shape. Okay? Now, the basic shape is made up of four anchor points and line segments. And you'll notice that in the middle, you see in the middle there's that little anchor point that shows you the center? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is kind of an important little thing for me because I'm going to start dividing this thing up and I need to know where the center is in order to do this well. So watch what I'm about to do. I'm going to get out my guides. To get my guides, I'm going to go up to the view menu and I'm going to show my rulers. Okay? There are my rulers. You guys familiar with the rulers? Have you ever seen them before? Yeah. You know what guides are? You know how to work with guides? Has anyone ever talked to you about that? We learned those. Cool. So I'm going to make a couple of guides. The top guide, I'm clicking and I'm dragging to bring a guide out. And I'm going to drop that guide right over top of that middle point right there. See where I am? I want mm -hmm. to be right in the middle of that, that oval. And then I'm going to come over here. I'm going to get a guide from this side. And I'm going to do the same thing. Bring it right over top of the middle there. So now I have a guide vertically and horizontally. And I got my shape. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to turn this shape, which is basically a solid shape. Watch what I do here. I'm going to take my fill, and I'm going to throw yellow into it. So now I have a fill of yellow and a stroke of black. Okay? What I want to do is I want to turn this shape into a donut. So let me show you how I do that. I'm going to go to the Edit menu, and I'm going to go Copy. There are other ways I could do this, but this is the way that I think is easiest and probably the best for you to understand. Edit, paste in front. So what I did 
was I copied the shape and I placed the shape directly in front of itself, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna get the free transform tool and I'm gonna come over to the corner, I'm gonna hold down the shift key and I'm gonna hold down the alt key. What, and the alt and option key if you're on a Mac, but the reason I'm holding the alt or option key down with the shift key is I wanna keep it as a circle by holding the alt and the option key, you see what it's doing? It's allowing me to make this circle smaller, but towards the center of the object. Yeah. You see what I did? So now I have two objects. Both of them have fills of yellow and a stroke of black sitting exactly in front of each other, creating what might become quickly a donut. Does that understand? Is that clear? Can you understand what I did? Yes, neat trick. Thank you. Neat trick. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the regular old selection tool, and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to marquee both of those shapes. Marquees meaning that I'm clicking and dragging and touching both of those shapes. Marqueeing. Now that I have both of those shapes selected, that's what marqueeing will do. Both of them are selected. I'm going to cut a hole with that shape out of that shape. And I do that by going up to the object menu and I go down to clipping mask, uh, I'm sorry, compound mask, a compound path make. And I just made a compound path. And what you have now is a hole in the middle of my shape. So that's the first part of this thing. Now this hole is not exactly the same size as that, but it doesn't matter all that much, okay? so. You understand what I'm doing? I could go control Z and undo this. There's another way I could do this. Go to the window menu and I can open up the Pathfinder palette and the Pathfinder palette will make compound shapes. This one right here, minus front, will do the same thing. This little object is sitting in front of that object. By clicking on that button right there, minus front, watch what happens. Same thing. See what I mean? So there are a number of ways that you can go about doing this same operation. Now, I wanted to bring the Pathfinder out because I'm going to use that divide command in a minute. So let me show you now how I created this series of separate little uh, elements from this single shape, because this is not too difficult either if you know how to do it. So again, I got my shape created. This is the basic shape that I'm going to use for my color wheel. I'm gonna get the, the, uh, the line tool and I'm gonna come over here, outside the shape, on the guide, hold down the shift key because I want the line to be perfectly straight and I'm just gonna run straight on down to here. And I have now put a black line straight down the center of that object. You notice how it's outside on both ends? That's a very important thing for you to understand. All right? Are you with me so far? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So far, so Okay. So what I'm gonna was, do is, uh, I'm gonna... There was a question in yeah, the chat. What's the question? Who is this? Um, it's Mindy, but there was someone asking a question about how to make the donut. They were asking if you could just simply make it white. No. No. No, you can't make it white because what you're doing is you're cutting this thing apart. And if it's white, you're not going to be cutting it apart. It's just going to be white sitting in front of there. See, if you make it white, what's going to happen is this. Watch. If I come back here and I take and I create a rounded rectangle, watch this. And I make that rounded rectangle black. And I go object, arrange, send to back. You see, because I cut the hole in there, you see how that is a hole? And you can see the black coming through. Right. So if you just used a, a white shape in front of this, watch what happens. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. If this was white shape, that's what you would see. That's not what you want. You want that. And, and you get that by using minus front or object compound path make and I can't it's not going to come up because there's nothing selected okay but that's okay. actually a compound path that's that's what we're doing and it's necessary because what I'm doing is essentially 
I'm slicing and dicing this shape up. I'm taking this shape and I'm cutting it into pieces so that I can create this uh, really nice little color wheel, okay? So now I have my first line and I'm gonna select it and I'm gonna go edit copy, edit paste in front, and then I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to get these tools right here. I wanna get my rotate tool. And notice that my rotate tool has a little gun sight. And what I want to do is I want to move that gun sight to make sure it's like right at the center. See how I moved it slightly? Made mm -hmm. it right to the center of my two. That's why these two guides are so important. Because these two guides are making it possible for me to do what I want to do with my pieces. Now I'm going to take this and I'm going to bring it around. And I'm going to hold the shift key down. And I've got two lines made. You see that? Watch when I go to the guides. View, guides, hide guides. You see what I've done? I've actually created two lines that are dividing this up. Now, I haven't divided anything yet, but I've actually begun the process of setting up the segments that I'm going to want to divide this into. So is that making sense so far? Is it any questions about what I'm doing? No. Good. All right. No questions from me either. Okay. If there are, you know, you need to speak up. So now watch what I do. Here, this is, I'm going to click on this one, hold down the shift key, click on this one. So now I have both of these lines selected. And I'm going to go edit, copy. All right. Now, the thing that you have to understand is I just copied those two lines to the, to the clipboard. I can bring as many of them out as I want right now because they're copied to the clipboard and they will stay copied to that clipboard until I copy something else. I'm actually going to use two of these. So the first one I'm going to, I think, did I actually go paste in front yet? I didn't, did I? Somebody remind me, I stopped and started. No, not yet. So edit, <laughs> paste in front. Not yet. Right. And now You copied, going, but you didn't paste. Okay, so now what I'm going to do and this is where, you know, it's a little dicey because there's no easy way to do this. I'm now going to, oh, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to put the rotate tool on it. There we go. And remember, the rotate tool isn't quite in the middle, so I'm going to move it into the middle, like about like that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to click, and I'm going to start rotating this. And I'm going to rotate this not quite, like maybe something like that. This is where it's tricky because there's no easy way to do this. There, okay? And then I'm gonna go edit, paste in front again. And now I'm going to reposition that center tool again because I still have this, I still have the uh, rotate tool selected. And I'm gonna take this one and I'm going to rotate that one over about like this. I'm trying to make these segments about the same size. They look okay. I, I'd say they're probably good enough for my purposes. So you see what I got here? Mm -hmm. And do you understand how I did that? Is there any questions at all about how I did that? No. Okay. So my goal here um, is, my goal here is, I am trying to set up a situation where I have approximately all the equal parts that I need to create that right there. And I've done that by using my oval tool and I've used these lines. So now I'm going to divide this whole thing up. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use this tool right here. And as, as I said to you before, I'm going to come and I'm going to marquee everything. So in other words, I want everything selected. That's the point of this. By marqueeing the whole thing, I select every part of this. And I notice that this isn't exactly, the segments aren't exactly perfect, but don't worry about that. I'm just trying to show you how to get this done. You can mess with this and make them more perfect if you want. So now that I got all these selected, I'm going to come over here and click on divide. And you see what it did? It essentially divided the whole thing up. Now I can come in here and I can marquee in the middle. It's grouped. I'm going to go object ungroup. And then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to marquee in the middle. And I'm going to delete that in the middle. And now what I have is I have my shape divided. How do I know it's divided? Because I can start putting colors in. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by selecting the whole thing, and I'm going to apply to the stroke. See what's forward? The stroke, everybody? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start off by hitting the stroke with gray. And now I'll deselect it, and you can see. Look at that. Look at that. I got all my gray strokes in there, don't I? So it's got to be working. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the fill forward, and I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to start selecting these shapes, and I'm going to start hitting them with color. Look at that. Isn't that nuts? And I just keep coming through the colors, and I just load my colors right into this. And if it moves like that, just go Control-Z, and it'll put it back into proper position. And I think that's the color. And then that's the yellow. And so I can skip that and go to the yellow green and the green and then this is the blue and then this is the dark blue and this is the purple and this is the violet and I missed the color didn't I which color did I miss uh, blue. which one did I miss was it the blue that one yeah. The medium blue, yes. Yeah, that's what it is. That medium blue, and then this should be the dark blue. Then this should be the purple, and that should be the violet. Look at that. That is how I did that. And you know what? If you need to, you can watch me do this again, and you shouldn't have any trouble doing this. This is really very simple to do. And then all you have to do is you have to show some of the different uh, complements and things. And let me show you how I did that because this is very interesting uh, and helpful as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm done with the pathfinder. I'm going to close that. I don't need this panel. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this entire thing again, and I'm going to rotate it just slightly because I want to get the red and the green on top. Okay. So one of the ones. One of the ones that you're going to show is complementary. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the complementary of the red and the green. Those are complementary of one another. So what I want to do is I want to show that relationship. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to select everything to the right, and I'm going to hold down the Shift key, and I'm going to select everything to the left. So all of these colors are selected. All of these colors are selected. That color is not selected. That color is not selected. Right? You all see that? Do you understand that? Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to open up another panel. This is called the transparency panel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I can do two things. I can play around with... Oh, and by the way, you see the little icon there? Mm -hmm. What do you notice about that icon, gang? Look at it carefully. Everything selected except the red and the it, green. It shows that the red and the green are missing. That's exactly right. So, you see, what I'm trying to tell you is, as you work with this program, look at what it's showing you. It's, it, 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 it has all these great little mechanisms that will show you what's going on so that you can feel confident that you're doing the right thing. So here's what I want to do. My goal here is to show the complementary color. So the thing that I think I want to do is I want to lower the opacity of the other colors, and that will feature the two complementary colors. So I'm going to do that by clicking this and setting it to like 30 degree or 30%. That's probably a little light. Let me go 40. There we go. That's pretty good. Look at that. Looks pretty nice, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the first thing that you're going to do. You're going to create something along the lines of that. Any final questions or anything at all that you want to talk about or ask me before we move on? Because that's, this is the first part of your project for the week. You're going to create something like this. And you also got to come up with some way of demonstrating, like for instance, see what I did here? I created a little arrow and then I put the word complimentary in there and I made the arrow gray and I made the complimentary black in a bold font. And what you're going to do is you're going to come up with some mechanism like that. Let's go view, zoom out. You're going to come up with some mechanism like that that will show whatever the complement or tertiary color, whatever you're doing. 
So do you understand what your what your project entails here? Yes. So are we doing I'm sorry, are we doing each one of them, the the complementary, the primary, secondary, and tertiary, or are we just selecting doing, one to do whatever it whatever it tells you? Hold on a second. The assignment is the assignment is to visually represent the following color relationships. Well, let's see now. This is assignment color wheel. Yeah, create a color wheel, 12 colors. Vi visually represent the following color relationships with li lines and triangles. Uh, hold on a minute here. Color explanation. Yeah, they want you to show the primary. So here's the primary. So you want something that'll look like that, okay? And then what you want to do is you want to show the secondary. So what you'll do is the same thing as this, only with a secondary color, okay? Like the orange and the blue. And then a tertiary color. And the primary is actually red, red, green, and blue. And this is actually complementary. So this is the complementary. So you're going to show primaries, red, green, and blue. You're going to uh, show secondary and tertiary. So what you'll essentially do here is you'll make the easiest way to do this is to make, watch, I'm going to undo this. Make one of these, make one of these. Okay, make one of these and then just copy and paste it and then just modify it to show primary, complementary, tertiary, and secondary. So you'll end up with one of these looking just like that and three others like this where you've changed to make them look something along the lines of this. Now you did also say that we didn't have to do it in, in the circle donut like you have it, that if we showed creativity and did something different. Show creativity, but bear in mind, here's the, here's the problem. Here's the thing that I don't want you to lose sight of. The goal here is for you to develop a color wheel. So if you're going to do this in another way, it needs to end up being a color wheel. In other words, you don't want to do this in a straight line. You know what I'm saying? It should be it should be some kind okay. of color wheel because it is a color wheel. So keep that in mind. It's very important not you, for you to not lose sight of that. It does get it to a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. You understand? I understand. Now. Thank you. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, I, I love it when people use creativity. But just, I'm just saying, got to be careful. Remember that there is an assignment. You really need to understand what the assignment is asking you to do. It's asking you to put together a color wheel. So if you want to get creative with it in some way, cool. I love it. But remember, it should be a color wheel. And you need to show primary colors, secondary, tertiary, complementary. And I've shown you a way that you could do it. Do you have to do it this way? No. You could possibly do it another way. I mean, if you want, you could do something like this where you, you know, come in here and do this, and then maybe do this, hold down the shift key, hold on a second, let me get this, hold on. You could do something like this, if you want. See what I mean? Ah. Hold on, there we go. I gotta deselect it, now drag that. You could do something like this if you want. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. You could do something like that. Or if you want, you could even, and I'm not saying that these are great solutions either. You could actually come in here and, you know, maybe make this a little okay. bigger. See what I'm saying? And then go object, arrange, bring to front. And you could do something like that if you want. I don't know. I See, I, I just, I wouldn't do that. To me, it just seems a lot easier to do the thing that I did, which would be control Z. Let me go back and undo this thing. So basically, what we have to make sure we never lose sight of is, is this assignment in specific indicates that we have to know the color wheel. So yeah. that's why we we yeah. should keep it consistent. Yeah, what you want to do is you want to, again, I give, I give, here are the colors. If you want, I'll load this up there for you. Uh, you could use those colors, but you don't need this. I'm telling you, you could easily go online and you could locate a color wheel and you could get one that looks so much like mine that you'd be amazed and you could just steal the colors right out of it. I'm telling you, that's how I did this. I went and found a color wheel and I took the colors that were presented in their color wheel and just used them in mine. 
I mean, this is not, this is more just a matter of how do you think and execute a task in Adobe Illustrator. That's really what this is about. Take a task, which is basically a limited task, and execute it using Illustrator. That's really what it's about. I have a question. Yep. Um, do we have to um, show you the the um, the twelve hues and the the numbers and the colors? If you want to, yeah. If you want to do that as part of your um, as part of your presentation, yeah. But ultimately, this is what you want, and it should look something like this. Here's a really good way to do it. That would do it. See the little arrow with complementary pointing at the complementary? Mm -hmm. That would work. If you did it that way, that would work. And if you had the arrows pointing to red, uh, green, and blue, for, uh, or primaries, red, uh, red, yellow, and blue, that would work as well. Arrowheads and then... Uh, um, uh, no, I understand that, but I'm just saying, primary. do you do you want us to tell you the numbers that we use, like how no. you have a? No. Yes. No. Okay. Uh, the reason the reason that I put the numbers here, look, the reason that I put the numbers there is just to show you that by putting those numbers in, I got those colors. Okay. That's the only reason I did it, I'm just trying to be thorough and show okay. you some of the things. It's really all it is. You don't need to do that. You can okay. swap, but you don't need to do that. This is what you need to do. Something okay. like this. And then figure out some way of letting me know what color you're illustrating. So one of them is going to look just like this. Right. And there's going to be three, and they're going to be, uh, or actually four, and they're going to be primary, secondary, tertiary, and complementary. So Got there are being five of these in all. And okay. all I'm saying to you to make this job easy for you, make one color wheel. Use the uh, same yeah. color wheel, do it some way, do it something like what I did, and use that same color wheel to generate the other color wheels, so you only got to build one, and then change the colors on them. Got it. So, I'm trying to make you understand that this can be easy if you make it easy, it can be hard if you make it hard. I'm not trying to make it e hard on you, I'm actually trying to make it easy on you. you I'm trying it. to give you the easiest path to success with this. Something along the line of what I did here would be great. All right? All right. So here's the other thing. This is the other thing that we're going to be doing. I live in I live in New Jersey and um, in New Jersey I'm right on the border of Pennsylvania. And everywhere I go in Pennsylvania I see hex symbols. And most of the time, what's interesting about hex symbols is they use primary colors. They're almost all the time red, yellow, and blue, and white, and black. Those are the colors that you see. So what I did was I decided that for my exercise, this is the assessment. I'm sorry, it's part two of the assignment, okay? Part two of the assignment, which is to create a color exploration. Um, I, I created this geometric design, and I used my design of a hex symbol as a way of showing my different colors. So this is what I did. I actually started off with red, yellow, and blue, and I created my hex symbol using the colors of red, yellow, and blue. So this is the same color as that. That is the same color as that. That is the same color as that. And it's red, yellow, and blue. Now I'm going to show tertiary. So all I have to do here is select the colors that I want. Like, for instance, watch this. Let's say I want to go, um, I want to go that, hold down the shift key, select that. Hold down the shift key, select that. Come over here and get my, pull my eyedropper out closer. Click on my eyedropper and click on the purple. And now that has changed to purple. Then I'm going to come in here, click on that red. Hold down the shift key, click on that. Click on that. Get my eyedropper tool. Click on orange. 
and then click on my yellow. Shift, 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 eyedropper, and there I have my tertiary. So this is the next part of your exercise, and that is to come up with something. And again, I just, from a creative standpoint, I thought visually this is a really nice way to go about it. Do you have to do this? No. I just did it because it occurred to me that that's... Question. What? I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. He broke up. I have a question. Is there a reason why... I'm sorry. Is this better? Yeah. I have a question. Is there a, re a reason why you left one of those petals blue and a heart red? Or is that was just oh, an no, oversight? Because I forgot. No, because I actually uh, I didn't select them properly. That's really what it was. I actually, no, I just didn't select them properly. Uh, this is what it really should look like. It should look like... Uh, it's just a mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm not really 100% paying attention to what I'm doing because I'm talking to you and thinking about that and doing this at the same time. So it's very easy for me to miss a little thing like that. But basically, what you're doing is you're coming in here and you're finding some way of presenting three colors or two colors or whatever the thing calls for. And then you're going to uh, load those colors in. Okay, now I'll show you one more here because you also run into this situation, right? You got this situation here where you've got red, green, complementary. So split complementary. So what you want to do is, and, and if you're going to do this complementary with a split complementary, what you're going to do here is you're going to do this. Come in and you're going to select this and you're going to come over here to uh, transparency and you'll set this whole thing back to 100%. So split complementary. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select that, hold down the shift key. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I want to click on that one, and then I'll hold down the shift key and click on these, and click on these. Okay? See? Look. Split complementary. See it? See it? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to drag them down to 50%. And now I'm going to load these colors in using the split complementary. Select all the blue, and I'll click on that color there. Whoops. And somehow or other, it didn't happen. What happened? I dropped it. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I didn't get the tool quite right. There we go. And now click on that. Bingo. There we go. And now I'm going to come over here and click on the orange. Shift orange, orange, orange. I drop orange and then yellow shift 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 and green now oh, i did it again i'm, I'm not thinking let me do it one more time and then get the eyedropper tool and green there you go i know they look awful but the bottom line is they 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 fill they fill the uh they fill the requirement okay so Come up with some kind of a graphic, some kind of a visualization, okay? Here's an analogous. This is another one that's kind of interesting. Let's see how this works with an analogous pose, all right? So this one here, I, I, I guess, because I'm, I'm selecting these things. This one here, let me, let's go file. So did you just pull an image off the internet? What, of this, uh, of this, um, Check sign? Yeah. Actually, I did, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me get rid of this because this one's all messed up. And let me go back over here. Hold on. Let me have a second to get over here. Grab this one. This will work. And it copy. And then over here. Give me a second. And it takes place. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is. This is actually partially done. All I have to do is change this, hold down the shift key, hold down the shift key, hold down the shift key, get my eyedropper, change it to red, and bingo, there you go. That one is essentially done, okay? So you understand what I'm doing is I'm taking some kind of a shape, which I'm asking you to do, 
And this is where you get to use your imagination. Come up with something that's creative. Come up with something that's unusual. Let me show you one more. I'm not going to actually tear this apart, but let me show you one more. Have any of you ever heard of the artist by the name of Piet Mondrian? No. That was a, he's a painter. And what he does is he paints in primary colors, and he paints using... Um, geometric shapes like this. So the other thing that I did was I found one of his typical compositions using red, green, a red, yellow, and blue. And that's the image right there. And what I've done is I've essentially come in here and I have taken his, uh, his, his uh, composition and I've more or less set it up so that I can come in here and I can use it to choose, let's see if I can find one that's really easy. So here's, here's the composition for tertiary. So watch what I choose here. I'm gonna click on that color right there, and I'm gonna go up into the uh, select same fill, okay? They're all the same fill. So I've selected all this blue fill, and then I'm gonna get the eyedropper tool. Let me bring the eye, I should have left that out. Then I'm going to get the eyedropper tool, and I'm going to click on the eyedropper tool, and I'm going to change that tree. Okay? And then I'm going to come on and select the red, and I'm going to go to the select menu, and I'm going to select the same fill color, and I'm going to get the eyedropper tool. And I'm going to make that one purple. See what I'm doing? Same basic thing. I'm just using somebody else's composition, the Piet Mondrian composition, and I'm actually using it to put together uh, this presentation of tertiary color. Using the select menu to select the same fill, and then I'm going to use the eyedropper tool to apply orange to it. So, do you think you get the idea? Yeah. And you can use whatever mechanism that you want just make sure that when you do it, you follow the directions. All right? Yes. All right. That's all I got to show you for tonight. I will take questions, uh, and then what I want to do very quickly before I close out our meeting is I want to run through the questions that you're going to encounter in your, uh, your assessment. So I want to give you an idea what that assessment's going to be and give you a little bit of an assistance with it. Okay, I have one question. This is Go Benita. Ahead. This is Benita. Go when ahead. you like, like for instance, when when you chose one of the squares to um to click on, and you you picked up a color from it. Over it, there. Yeah, did it change like all of the colors? Did it do it all at once, or was you? Yeah, let me explain to you how I did that. I have that shape right there. That shape right there, that shape, that shape, that shape, that shape, and that shape. They all have the same fill. So knowing that, and it's the same with this, this purple, that, 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 right. that, they all have the same fill. So I know that if I click on that shape right there, and if I go up to the select menu, I can come down and choose to ch select the same. Remember, it's the select panel. So I'm asking this to select the same fill color. And you see how it automatically goes in and it selects everything that's got the same fill in it. Okay. And then I can go in and I can change the color by just grabbing an eyedropper tool and making it a different color. Get the idea? Yeah, and and where did you find that at again? That's in select. Select same fill color. But what you have to remember is you have to first create a series of colors that have the same fill. And I created one, two, three sets of colors that have fills that are the same as the shapes. So I can easily click on any one of these. And because I know that there's some extra shapes out here that has that color, I can just go to the select menu, same, fill. And it clicks or it selects all those fills. All right, but at first these colors was like red, 
um, yeah, but yellow that's and because, green. Yeah, that's yeah, it, and it, but it doesn't matter because the bottom line is whatever I color, whatever I color I put in here goes in here. So it ends up being the same color. So if okay. I go, let me go file revert, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Go revert, okay, and now it reverts back. And here are the here are the original colors that they were in. There's the blue, there's the yellow, there's the red. Now if I click on that one, or let me click on the yellow. If I click on the yellow and I go select same fill, then all the same fills select. And okay, so so basically, you found a picture, uh, you found a graphic off the internet, and then what you and you you you, you put it into this document. No, I didn't, made, no, I didn't. I actually rendered it into this. I didn't just put it in. You can't just take something off the internet, plop it down, and it automatically does this. What I did was I found a composition that was done by Piet Mondrian, which looks very much like my sketch, and those are the colors. And I rendered it using basic shapes and, and, and um, uh, the stacking order to create my composition. And I made sure that they were in three colors, the blue, the yellow, and the red, so that I could go in and I could choose colors to change those colors out. I actually had to build this. And it's the same thing with these hex symbols. I did go in and I did find a hex symbol online, but I literally had to draw my shapes from the hex symbol. I couldn't just put the hex symbol in there. It wouldn't work that way. I had to draw these shapes. Okay. Okay? Okay. Is that, is that what you understood? Yeah, because I thought that you just grabbed some pictures and then you made the square boxes and then... Okay. No, no, you can't do that you, because those those pieces that you're getting off the internet are bitmaps, and okay. bitmaps are not vector art, and you can't modify a bitmap that way. You have to actually get an image or create an image. That's why you don't have to go on the internet and do this. You can create your own little composition if you want, but just okay. remember that the composition has to be at least three colors so that you can go in and you can modify it according to the choices that they give you. And that's what this does. Let's go file revert on this. And it come back and see that it does the same thing. It gives me a blue area with blue color, a yellow area with yellow color, and a red area with red color that I can select and I can change the colors into. That, that's the whole point of this. And I, I use the hex symbol because I'm familiar with the hex symbol and I thought that would be a really nice way to show these color relationships. So how are you going to know the before and after or something? I mean, maybe I'm just tired, but <laughs> if I would start off with I would start off with having uh, I would start off with well one of the things that they ask you to do. Let's see in the assessment. Give me a second here. Find it in the assignment two. So it's asking you for analogous, tertiary, and complementary. Okay. So what I would do is I would start off by maybe doing uh, primary, red, green, or red, yellow, and blue. That's mm -hmm. what I would do, primary. And then I would do, uh, I would do the, um, the analogous colors using three colors adjacent to one another. The tertiary, which this is. So you would basically start off with one that looks like this. And then you would create your wheel showing the tertiary colors that you're going to change it to. So the first one would look like this, and this wheel would just be primary. Red, yellow, and blue. Right there, right? Okay. Okay. So that's what the first one would be. The second one would look like this, and then you would change these colors. Okay, you would change. So we should the use the same the, the same one all the way through, so you can yeah. see the progression of it. That's so. right. It's, okay. It's, in a way, in a way, this can be done almost the same way that you are doing the uh, the color. The other one. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay. Now I want to get out of here real quick. Is there any other questions? I only got a few minutes left, and I want to very quickly blow by you your um, your assessment. So, who discovered white light was composed of visible colors? Who can tell me that? Sir Isaac Newton. There you go. So, if you answer Sir Isaac Newton to the first question, you'll get it right. The color wheel was developed when Sir Isaac Newton bent the color spectrum into a circle. Is that true or false? 
That's true. There you go. So you answered true and you got that right. Now, match each word to the term to the correct meaning. Saturation. What is saturation? Do you remember what I told you it was? You? No, saturation is the oh. amount of purity in the color. So as I'm you, sorry. As you desaturate it, you're adding white to it, remember? Right. Okay. So saturation is the amount of purity of the color. Cool colors. What are the cool colors? Um, blue. Green. Um, one more. And blue. Yeah, no, you got blue. Blue, green, and violet. Those are the cool colors. Complementary colors. What's a complementary color? The ones across from each other? That's right. The ones directly opposite of each other on the color spectrum. What's a hue? Color. Um, the, the red, yellow, and blues that cannot be mixed into any other Here's colors. Easier answer. Easier answer. What is a hue? It's color. A color. 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 Oh. A hue is a color. A hue defines pure color in terms of green, red, magenta. Hue is another word for color. Warm colors. What are warm colors? Red, orange, and yellow. There you go. So there you know what you're going to have to answer for that. How does the human eye see color? Is, this one you probably won't know because you'll have to read it in your book. So let me. Is it through a prism or a, a rod or something? No, the human eye and the brain together translate into color. You'll okay. read the chapter yeah. and you'll see that. So the what is what is the Pantone matching system? We really didn't discuss that tonight. So I will tell you essentially, it's a proprietary color space used in a variety of industries, primarily printing. Okay. Okay, okay. Now, there's two more questions, and then you know what? We're done for tonight. What does what you see is what you get mean, and why is it not applicable to printed color? You'll read about this, but what you see is what you get. That's what W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G means. What you see is what you, what get. you get. Yeah, and it is not applicable to color because printed color and output color display differently. And there are, there are variances in colors. They're not consistency. They are not reliable. So what you see is what you get is not reliable because of the in, in, inconsistencies between different devices. But you'll read about this, but that's essentially it. Now, the last question, name four color models. The four color models are, we, we talked about two of them tonight. CMYK is one, that's a color model. CMYK is another. Right. CIE is another. What is it? CIE. CIE. And then HSV is another. But again, you'll read and you'll, but, th but that, is your, that is your assessment. That's what you're going to be doing. I am completely done with this. Are there any final questions? If not, I am going to end for the evening. So you got your moment. What do you got to say? Thank you. Good night. I have just fun? like to say yeah. thank you. <laughs> Did you have fun? I have to rush off to yeah. another class, but okay. thank you. Was it torture? No. <laughs> okay. I am going to come in here now. I'm going to attempt. I'm going to attempt to uh, shut this down. Stop recording.